Join us as Pastor Art Dykstra walks through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. If you were here last week, the disciples, Jesus shows up according to John for the third time to his main group of disciples, and this time it's on the sea, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he tells them to throw their net on the right side of the boat. They come up with this extraordinary cast of fish. The net is full. And he spells it out really clearly. What this has to do is, look, you're working in your own strength. You worked all night. Now let's see what happens when you listen to what I have to say and do it in my strength and not in your strength. So the whole chapter of John chapter 21, all the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all end with the resurrection and the great commission. John does something, strangely enough, different that the others don't do. And it's very purposeful and it's really important because he's painting this huge, massive picture for Peter, his buddies, and those of us that are here at 13880 Feather Sound Drive this morning. So pay attention because this is God's word, not just for Peter, but for us. And in chapter chapter 21, verse 15, here's how it goes. They... Jesus miraculously, he sets this dinner up, and again, I mentioned last week that I just love it that Jesus shows up and makes them breakfast. That's pretty spectacular. He continues being a servant, even in his glorified state. And it says, when they had finished eating, in the Near East, eating a meal together was always an intimate thing. You were inviting someone into your life. You didn't do that casually. And this speaks clearly of fellowship. Jesus wants to do business. He's about to do business. The whole chapter is about the restoration of Peter. But before he does that, he's going into it graciously, inviting Peter back into relationship, back into fellowship. And then he says to Simon Peter, note that John says Simon Peter, the name that Jesus gave him, Peter the Rock. He says something different. Simon, son of John. It's like, or John Dykstra, your mom's, (laughs) this is serious. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And I could see the emotion probably welling up in Peter. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said differently, take care of my sheep or tend to my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And at this point, Peter is kind of getting devastated. It actually says he was grieved or hurt. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, he's asking this question, Jesus, do you love me? Last week I mentioned the questions Jesus, that God asks of us. You start in Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, and uh, and what happened is Adam and Eve, they had one opportunity to obey God with regard to the tree. Obey, don't obey. And what they did is they disobeyed. In essence, what happened is they said, you know what? You no longer belong on the throne of my life, God. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to choose what's best for my life. I am the master of my own destiny. And they kicked Jesus off the throne room of their life, which we all tend to do. And here's what God asks them in Genesis chapter 3. He says, Adam, where are you? Was that a question for Adam or was it a question for God? God's like, huh, you know what? I, uh, I'm kind of forgetful, getting a little old. I'm billions and billions of years old type of thing. I'm eternity. No, it wasn't for God's benefit. It was for Adam's benefit. He's wanting him to come clean. And then three verses, four verses later in 13, he says, what is it that you have done? He's not going, uh, I'm literally limited in my thinking. And I just, I, I know something's up. Something's fishy going on here. Just spill it, Adam. But it's not for God's benefit. These questions God asks are always for our benefit. What is it that you've done? Come clean, because unless you come clean, there is no restoration to relationship and fellowship, is the whole point of the story. And so you see throughout Scripture, God asking all these questions. In fact, it's interesting, throughout the book of John, starting in John chapter 5, and I'll just give you a snippet. Jesus shows up, and he's at the the pool of Bethsaida, not far from the Temple Mount. I've been there, and, uh, and there's... There was a legend that if the water would stir, and the, stir, the first person that would enter into the water, they would get healed. And so they've got this crippled man, and Jesus rolls up and says, Hey, uh, 
do you really want to be made well? That was the question for the crippled man. And you know what he does? He gives all kinds of excuses. Oh, there's nobody here to help me. I, I've been sitting here for a long... I'm not looking for excuses. You have to decide. Do you want to take the steps to be made well? A few chapters later, John chapter 13, Jesus... Or John chapter 8, Jesus asked the question to his disciples. Who do you say that I am? See, the question is not just for them. It's for them, but it's for us. That's why it's recorded. That's why we're reading it. Because every one of us has to decide who Jesus is. Am I going to make a God in my own image, or am I going to believe what the Bible has to say, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for my sins, that I am a sinner, that I am in desperate need of grace, and I'm going to keep going down this path that ultimately leads me to an eternal separation from him, unless I declare by faith that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago, and that we celebrate Easter for a reason. That he truly rose from the dead. Now, we have to decide that in our heart. And that's the question, not for today, but that we all have to answer. And then we come up to yest- our last week. They've been working all week long, casting their net, all night long, casting their net, zero fish. And Jesus shows up from the shore and says, haven't you any fish, brothers? And they say, no, not happy. We've been doing this all night. Just flat out no. The question wasn't for Jesus. Hey, I'm really curious. Just wanted to know. I'm doing a count here. I'm working for the Wildlife and Game Commission. Just want to know what kind of fish. No, he's asking it for their benefit. How are things going, guys? You worked in your own strength. Is that going well for you? And that was the main part of the main message last week. I think something applicable that we have to keep meditating on really spoke to me. Today... There's another question that God asks for our benefit to Peter, each of us. And here it is in verse 15. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? I love it that he waits till after fellowship, after breakfast. Not just, okay, I'm going to come in there and I'm going to let you have it, Peter. I'm entering into relationship. And then he takes Peter to the side and he's dealing with the elephant in the room. Why is he doing that? One, he doesn't do it with condemnation. He doesn't come in there going, okay, you're such a turkey. Look at you. I don't even know why I put up with you. He takes him to the side and he goes and takes him through this gracious thing. You know why it was so important for Jesus to do this? Peter was being raised up in his kingdom, like all of us being raised up in God's kingdom in its different ways. But in essence, what he was doing is, look, if I don't deal with this, I know Peter probably wanted nothing. Okay, don't, please don't, please Jesus, don't bring this up. Don't bring up the fact that I denied you three times. And then the last time I denied you, I cursed pretty badly. You know, I just, I'm, I'm this close to being apostate. Please don't bring that up. I, I'm, having, I'm in fellowship with you again, but he knows that he needs to deal with it. He does it graciously. You know why? Because if he hadn't dealt with it, you know what a foothold is? You're rock climbing and you want to grab something. This is a great foothold or arm hold or, or something like that because it allows me to then get a stronghold and to get in there tight. And that's what the enemy's trying to do in our life. He's looking at your character, my character, and he's going and saying, look, I'm looking for an in. I'm looking for an, an opportunity to condemn you. See, that's, he's the father of lies. He's the father of untruth. And I know them. I know that you know them. But he's going to come for Peter's the rest of his life if this is not dealt with. And Peter's going to be the supposed leader of this early church. And there's always going to be in the back of his head, head the opportunity for the enemy to go, hey, Peter. You call yourself a leader? Hey, remember when you denied Jesus three times? Hey, Peter, you're such a hypocrite. Hey, Peter, remember that. And you see, the enemy does that exact same thing in each of our lives, doesn't he? Hey, come on, I'm going to remind you of your failings. I'm going to do it over and over and over, and if we don't deal with that, if we don't reset our identity and put it back on Jesus, he's always going to have access for that foothold, and if not dealt with, can always lead to a stronghold in our life. And I love the fact and how Jesus does this. You know, the, other qu- the three questions weren't, Hey, Peter, are you going to fail me again? Verse 17, 16. Hey, Peter, hey, Peter, are you going to fail me again? Hey, Peter, you failed me a couple times. 
Are you going to fail me again? He doesn't do that. He doesn't come in with that. He comes in and says, look, let's do a reset. Do you love me, Peter? He calls him Simon, son of John, the formal name, not Peter the Rock, his usual nickname. And the purpose of that is, I believe, is he's telling them, stop acting like your old self. You are no longer Simon, son of John. I'm moving you into your new identity again. Act like your new identity. And I love that about God, is that what he can do is in Romans, it tells us that God who gives life to the dead and he calls things which are not as if they were. What he's saying there is that God looks at you and he sees you as you will be. And that's your identity because it's based in Jesus Christ, not in your ability to perform, but in God's ability to perform it in you. Isn't that amazing? In the Passover, Passover uh, Seder last night, the, the rabbi, I thought this was so great the way he worded it. He said, look, the, le- the blood of the lamb was applied to the doorposts of the people of Israel in bondage in Egypt before they ex- were extracted into the promised land. And he said the angel went about and he didn't go and look and say, yeah, the blood's applied, but I know what you did this week. Ah, that consistent care. You know, there's a bit of a flaw in you, that type of thing. That's not quite his words, but that's what I got out of it. Just, he went and saw one thing and one thing only. Was there blood applied? And so it is with Christ. It matters a one thing. doesn't matter what you've did, that you apply the blood of Christ. Your life has changed and will change. And you can stop acting like your old self and act like your new identity. And he asks them, do you love me? And he uses the word based on the Greek word agape. We've all heard it before. Traditionally, we've heard it as this unselfish God type love. This love that we don't tip, tip, no strings attached kind of love. And he says this, agapeo. And he says, do you truly agapeo me? And he says, more than these. Now scholars, if you look into the Greek, and I tried to figure it out, but the Greek is kind of obscure. He says, do you love me more than these? What does he mean? By these, he's probably waving his hand and you could see it if you watch the movie later. (laughs) Um, But he's referring to one of two things. He's either referring, hey, Peter, hey, Peter, I got to know, do you love me? And I'm asking this question specifically. You just finished fishing the entire night. Your identity, you went back to fishing when I've called you to be fishers of men and you went back to your old self, your old lifestyle. And you know what? He was an owner of a boat. The owner of the boat got 60% of the catch. He's probably doing a lot better off than the average worker. We know that Peter had a fairly nice house. Archaeologists have dug up what they think could be Peter's house. I don't know how they know that. A little bit nicer than the rest. Um, But he had a house. Mother mother in-law lived there with him, that type of thing. And so it was probably bigger. He probably had access. Hey, I got a good lifestyle. I fish when I want. I got workers working for me. I'm a businessman. I got the good life, the good Galilean life, the Galilean dream. And do you love me more than these? You went back to fishing. Do you love me more than these? This is a question I have for you, Peter, because I need to know where your heart is. Now, that's a possible answer. I think it's not wrong for us to put our brain there because the Bible is obscure on what he's referring to. I think it's a great question for every one of us. Do I love you, Jesus, more than insert this X here? Do I love you more than you're single? Do I love you more than the boy? Do I love you more than the girl? You know, it's a question I often ask. You deal with situations and people are living not according to God's word. They're they're living together, and, and my question is always, hey, God's word is pretty clear on this. I'm not coming with condemnation, but you're basically saying, Jesus, I love the boy more than I love what you have to say in obedience to your word. Oh, no, no, I love Jesus. No, no, you wouldn't because you're listening to the boy or vice versa. Uh, it doesn't matter the circumstance. That's just an example. Hey, in my marriage, I'm living it out this way. Do I love you more than... I, I want to glorify you in my marriage, or do I want to look for my own comfort? I don't know. That's for each of us to insert X what that is. That's the question, though. Do I love you more than these? More than likely, though, this is what I think it is. When he says, do you love me more than these? It's not the boats, the lifestyles, the good life. It's probably a reference to the other guys. Why do I think that? Because Peter, eight chapters before, In verse 37 of John chapter 13, he says, look, I will follow you, Jesus, anywhere. Jesus says, hey, I'm leaving, uh, going down this path. And he goes, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll lay my life down for you. The Matthew 26, 33 account actually says this. Even if the others desert you, 
I and fall away, I will not. Do you know what this is? This is spiritual pride. It's subtle. He's like, look, those others, my faith is of a wholly different level than yours. It's better than theirs. I'm better than them. They might fall away, but I won't. And God knows that and says that needs to be defeated. And what he's saying here is, Peter, do you really truly love me more than these guys like you declared eight chapters previously, a couple days beforehand? Do you really have a better love than you declared? At this point, I, I just think if, again, we're watching the DVD later, you're going to see Peter's Adam's apple go up and down. Gulp. I see what you're saying. And he answers yes. When Jesus says, do you, feel, do you agape love me? He says, yes, I do. But now he's so humbled that he can't respond with any reference, but I love you, phileo. This deep, affectionate love is what it typically means. Now, most modern, uh, many modern scholars, not most, but one in particular, D.A. Carson, he's kind of a big deal in the world of evangelical Christianity, and he's a professor, and he says, look, don't make too big of a deal between the difference between agape and phileo, because John uses them somewhat interchangeably throughout the book of John, and you see some evidence of that throughout the New Testament. However, the one thing that I keep coming back to is one thing that we know is that Greek far more than English, is a very precise language. And John specifically chooses these words. John tells these things uh, and is very methodical in the way he has chosen to present who Jesus is. He chooses seven miracles. He chooses seven major events. He chooses these light and dark motifs. He is painting a picture, and he has chosen these words very specifically. And it would be odd, it would be normal, you would think, if there was no difference, that he would just use phileo or agape, but he doesn't. He goes back and forth. And in chapter 21, verse 17, actually uses the same word, phileo, two times. And so I'm going to move ahead with that, because I believe that he's truly making a differentiation between the two types of love. He's been humbled because that's what he wants to communicate. What's happening here is the beginning of God's gracious restoration in response to some pretty significant sin. He didn't tell a little white lie. I actually denied you. I came to the line of really almost being apostate. And Jesus tells him after he says, yes, I love you. I have a deep affection for you. And he goes, good. Well, then feed my lambs. You know what's happening here? He's saying, Peter, you're usable. I've called you to be a fisher of men in Mark chapter 1, verse 39. I've called you to be in in Matthew chapter 4. You'll no longer fish for fish. You're going to be a fisher of men. He goes, I'm going to add to your vocation right here. I want you to shepherd my sheep. And note he says this, tend to my sheep. Feed my lambs. He didn't say, feed your lambs. He's saying, feed my lambs. And there's something that we need to understand there, is that these aren't Peter's sheep. These are my sheep. These are God's sheep, not ours. You know, your children, parents, they're not your sheep. They're God's. And there's a wholly different approach to parenting when you realize that God has given you this treasure, this opportunity to raise his kids to shepherd his sheep. Jesus is the sheep, chief shepherd. And he, a, a shepherd, what he does is here it says feeds, and some translations say tends. What the significance of this is that it's our job to make sure that sheep are eating healthy meals. And what's happening here, it's Sunday morning, 11 something, 11.45. There's a whole lot of 11 a.m. Sunday morning services. In different time zone, there's a lot of 10 a.m. services. There's a lot of church going on in America right now. And guess what? A ton of them are eating garbage. At best, there is all kinds of slick, sugar-coated stuff that is so refined, it's going to be of no earthly good and bring you all kinds of spiritual illnesses if I take that metaphor to its length. Such is the state of evangelical Christianity here. Tasty meals with no nutritional value or garbage. Because America is looking to have their ears tickled. 
And the reality is there is no spiritual growth in the middle of some false gospel. You're not going to see the flashing lights and the smoke here. Well, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just that we don't want to get away from the meat. You know, you want food as a believer, and I pray that you would be here, but there is even in our, in our city all kinds of stuff that goes on that you look at and you just go, what in the world are you teaching? You open the Bible once, and the rest of the time you sang an 80s song or something like that. I don't know. i do not not calling any one specific church. I'm just saying, look, we can use some of these techniques, but let's come here to eat meat because Peter is told to feed my sheep, not to give them snacks. Pastor Michael, Pastor Mike, and myself, we're going to give you, as I said in the first service, we're not going to give you, we're going to give you a buffet, okay? And we're not going to give you a China King buffet. We're going to give you a roll and oats, health food store, full of organic stuff. Take it or leave it. That's up to you. But we take our responsibility seriously that we want to give you the straight up real deal. Why? Because it's going to be transformative in your life. And it's not going to take you down this path where you think you're okay. And you find out that you totally missed it in the comfort of your church. And he says, feed my lambs. He changes those words back and forth. This lambs to probaton, which is just simply a four-footed grazing animal. But he says very specifically, my little sheep. These are the immature ones. And so many times, pastors and leaders, and they focus on, hey, you're just a, you know, you're a low-maintenance guy. I'm going to really just kind of emphasize. He's called us. He's called you, parents. He's called you, leader, us, to invest in growing up the immature ones that are struggling. Called us to those areas. And in verse 17, he continues on and says, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Oh, in verse 16, I'm sorry. And he rewords it. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he goes, yes, I know it, so take care of my sheep. And he changes and rewords and he says, do you truly love me, agape? And he says, I, I, not comparing to other people, I just want to know deep in your heart, do you really love me? And he says, yes, I do. And he answers with the same word, yes, I have this great affection for you. And he responds again graciously, now take care of my sheep. The word for take care of or whatever you have in your translation, the word means govern, lead. The best one I think I could look in the Greek dictionary is to... to to watch over. You know, watch over my sheep. So you can expect us, whether we like it or not, it's so uncomfortable, but we're going to call out errors. We're not going to live mamby-pamby Christianity, and we're going to live out those errors as best as we can as fallible people. And he says, sheep, this time. He's speaking now specifically, take care of the ones that are more mature as well. Not just the ones that are struggling, and verse 17, he goes on the third time. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, this time, I'm sure he's probably about the point of weeping. Because it says Peter was hurt or grieved. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Well, feed my sheep. This time Jesus changes, and this is why I believe clearly that we can learn and apply these things, that there is a difference between those words. He says, do you phileo me this time? All right? You love me more, <laughs> do you love me more than these others, whatever that is? Well, do you even love me? Do you even have a close affection for me? And he answers, yes, kyrios. Key word, yes, master. Yes, Lord, you're my master. And he says, you know this. You know all things. You know that I love you. Here's an insight into the actual, the organization of the, the Greek here. There's two different words. Here it just says, you know all things. You know that I love you. But in the Greek, there's actually multiple different words for the word know. And there's two different here. Previously, G, uh, Thomas had said oida. You know this thing. You just know. And then he says, you are familiar with, you gnosko. The word means you know because of experience, by prolonged exposure to you, that I love you, that there's evidence of it, that you can see it. It's not just merely intellectual assent, but Jesus, I'm praying that you can see it, that I have evidence in my life that I have made you my master. 
Peter, it says, was sorrowful. He was grieved. He wasn't sad because he was caught in his sin, but he was humbled. And that was the goal of what Jesus was doing. He took him to the spiritual woodshed, which I pray all of us do. I, I met with this guy this week for a potential ministry position. And the thing that so impressed me with him is he'd been through the ringer. And I said, what are you looking to keep yourself on track? He goes, you've been through this tough time or you made bad decisions. And he goes, I pray every day that God would keep me broken. I was like, what a prayer. He went through a terrible, I mean, he went through hardship because of it. And he prays, God, that you would keep me broken on a daily basis. Because a broken person is a usable person. Peter was broken. Three denials, given three opportunities to affirm his love. And there's a restoration that rooted out those things that Satan could have used for the rest of his leadership life. And the third time he tells him, okay, now feed my probatons. Feed my sheep. My, feed, my sheep need to be fed. Verse 18 and 19, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, went where you wanted, but when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is basically Jesus is being Jesus. I'm glorified. I know all things now. I'm giving you prophetic. I'm going to tell you how you're going to die. And they're going to, you lived your life the way you wanted to, did what you want, but someone's going to lead you one day. They're going to stretch out your arms and you're going to go where you don't want to go. You're not going to be happy about it, but there's something that's going to happen because of it. You're going to glorify me. You know, Peter died 34 years later during the Nero's persecution. And all the church early fathers said, Peter was crucified upside down. He made a choice. I don't, I'm not worthy to die on a cross like my Savior. Put me upside down and nail me to the cross. Prophetically, your arms are stretched out. His arms were stretched out and he was crucified on a cross upside down. And he glorified God through the way he chose to die. That seems remarkable. Verse 20 Peter turned and saw the disciples whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, is going to who is going to betray you? That's how we know it was John, the disciple who Jesus loved, um, who wrote this. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. What he's saying here, and please don't miss this because this is really, really important. Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, stop it. Get your eyes off of others. Get them off John. Do not compare your love to others. Do not compare yourself to John. Stop having this competition. Every man according to his own master rises and falls is what Peter says in Romans. Look, it's not about you comparing to other people. It's you dealing with your relationship directly with me. Get your eyes on me and me alone, the author and perfecter of our faith. Your instruction is to follow me. And I think and I look back and I see all the stupid things that people have done in the church because the church is full of hypocrites. I know it, but guess what? That's where hypocrites need to be, right? And you always hear that same joke. There's always room for you. <laughs> look, the reality is till the day you die, till the day I die, there's going to be levels of hypocrisy in our life as we hopefully less and less as we go through sanctification. But you know you're in for trouble if you've got your eyes on that person who has a secret sin that you only know about or acts in a way that it wasn't nice or kind to you. People are at all different levels in the church. Get your eyes off them and you get your eyes on one thing. Jesus. And you, me, I follow him and get the distractions out of the way. And in verse 23, Jesus says, look, because of this, the rumor spread amongst the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? There's a lot of false doctrines that have started by not being precise in the Bible and taking things out of context. You see all kinds of cults that remove little words. Jehovah Witnesses, John 1.1. 1, 1. That, God, that Jesus was the Word and the Word was a God. No, it doesn't say that. The Word was God. Here you remove one little letter, two little letters in English, if I wanted him 
to, I want him to remain alive. And a rumor starts that John's never going to die. John's writing this. I'm going to include this because uh, people think I'm not going to die. And that's not true. Be precise when dealing with the Bible. Take it seriously. Verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. John is an eyewitness. Why is this important? 47 times he uses the word witness. I told you John uses precise language. There's a very specific purpose that he's writing. And that's why he writes precisely. He's writing in particular because he wants us to say there is enough evidence in particular from the different witnesses, the Father, the Holy Ghost, the prophets, John the Baptist, us personal witnesses. There's all kinds of witnesses. And he uses the word 25 times truth. You need to correlate the fact that there is truth from all these different witnesses. It's just not some random person who says this. I'm still alive. You can read it. I'm giving it to you. First person account. There is accounts of this from one generation later of John's gospel. We have it accurately transmitted to us. We know that it's true. Look, be a witness. This is it. First person witness. You can believe this. I believe that John lived longer than anyone else for one reason. <clears throat> to be a witness. All the other disciples are dead. Perfect opportunity for people to come in and say, hey, guess what? Peter's not around. He can't refute this. Jesus didn't die on a cross. He didn't raise to new life. He didn't conquer death. Oh, no. Oh, hey, why don't you? John's hanging out on Patmos. Hey, go past Ephesus. He started a church there. You know what? I've got this letter, actually, first person account, witness, eyewitness account. It'll hold up in a court of law in those days, you know, having an eyewitness account. And that was his purpose. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. I just think, man, this world is a big place. If you wrote all kinds of books about Jesus, is this hyperbole? I really don't think it is, and I'll, I'll tell you why. You know, he turned water into wine, healing lepers, the blind, paralyzed, feeding the multitudes. Do you know that Jesus in John chapter 1 says that he's the word and that he spoke the world into existence? here's the guy who wrote the DNA code. I have a laptop, brand new. It's a month old. It has one quarter of a terabyte. Trust me, it's a lot of information. You could put a lot on there, a lot of music, a lot of books. The DNA code alone, in a single strand of DNA, would fill up 700 terabytes of information. This is just a, this is a language. All biologists agree that here is a software code, I guess you could say, a language that directs everything that happens summarized in five letters. Is that not remarkable? It governs everything that goes on that you're listening to right now, the synapses that are going in your brain, all governed by this five-letter software code inside of this tiny little structure of a double helix. And that's just one thing about how amazing Jesus is and the things that he's done the next thing is, you know, I love the stars and I love, the, I, I love looking through a telescope and I love looking at books and the pictures of the, heli, the Hubble telescope. There are 70 billion trillion known stars. And they're all different. Different composition. Red dwarf. Uh, white giant. Different gravities. All kinds of different exoplanets. If you could write all those books, you'd never fill just the books describing all the things that are going on in our universe. You'd never fill the universe. Do you know that there are 8.7 million species on Earth? Would you like to have this one in your, underneath your bed? Fortunately, that's not found in Florida. Some of the bugs I found online were amazing. Do you know there are over 2 million types of insects alone? Look at this one. This is a I think there's God and he's inventing these things. And uh, this praying mantis on the next page, he's like, okay, I got the praying mantis. Now I'm going to really outdo the praying mantis. Isn't that spectacular? If all the things that Jesus did, all the world wouldn't be able to fill all the books that we've written about him. Now I'm finished right there. We're finished the book of John. All right. What does this mean to me right now? I believe it's the message for us is a call to discipleship and leadership. And the first point I want to make is that the thing that is so important for us to understand is that he starts off with this idea of be love. In verse 15, he says, do you love me? Do you truly love me more than these, whatever these are? The Old Testament is summed up. The law is summed up in one thing. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Why? Because if you love God well, you're not going to do any of those other things on that whole list. I'm not going to commit adultery, lie, cheat, all these different things if I love God. And the question it starts with, it begins right here as a first step. If I love Jesus, it will gnosko show. It will show by experience. Not to be legalistic. You don't have to sit there and go, man, look at all the great things I did because it flows out of your heart. But if you can't look and examine your life and go, I, you know what, there's no evidence that I really love Jesus because it, the evidence shows that I really love myself. Because everything I do revolves around my own happiness and the pursuit of what I selfishly think is best for my life. Which you're wrong in. But you should be able to, I should be able to see the gnosko. We should be able to know that it shows in my life, your life. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says something really odd. If this is a call to discipleship is what ca Peter's calling is being called to. And in Luke chapter 14, he says, look, if you love me and, are, and follow me, you must hate your mother and father. What? This seems weird. Is this in my Bible? Actually, it does say that. But what do we know? Because Scripture interprets Scripture. If we know the context of what Jesus says, he's all about love, what he's meaning, and what he's referring to, he's talking about the, you have to count the cost. In other words, nothing can compare to my love. Do you really truly love me more than these? Insert X for your life. That's my job, by the way. I don't want to leave you here with going, hey, that was, I got five points out of this morning message. No, apply it. Ask yourself that question. What do I love more than Jesus? Does it show in my life? What competes for my affection and my time, my finances? Second, not only be loved, and that's where it starts, but it moves on to be fed. You want a great way to stunt your growth? Perfect way. Just stop eat, having calories. Don't eat. Drink water and some vitamins. You might survive for a while, but you'll never grow and you'll atrophy. You know that sheep need to be fed for seven hours a day. If I have a sheep and I give them food, there's a nice pasture and some grain right there and I, whatever they eat, and I stick them in that closet right there, there's two problems. One, he's not in a place to be fed and there's no way for him to actually apply it, the food that I give him. If I put a muzzle on his face, put the food in front of him, he can't do it. It's the same principle for us. Be fed. Stop this foolish thinking that one hour in church is going to make us disciples. It's not. It's a start. It's a place to be fed. But the challenge is to go deeper. What am I doing throughout the week? What am I doing to cultivate being fed? And again, I need to be in a place to be fed and to receive it. There's simply no growth without it. And he tells us clearly, feed my lambs. It's indispensable to lamb growth, sheep growth. The third thing is we start to come in for a landing is be a feeder. Verse 15 and 16 to 17, he says, okay, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. I believe clearly that God calls all of us as followers to discipleship, which means discipling. Peter, as I mentioned, wasn't called just to be a fisher of men. He was called to bring people into the harvest, to fish for them, catch them, but he's added to his vocation right here. Now you're also called a shepherd. And in a sense, every one of us is both. Parents, leaders, wherever you find yourself in life. You know, you're a shepherd, but you're also a fisherman, fisherwoman, fisher person, whatever you want to call it. Dawson Trotman, he's the founder of the Navigators. He was a fisherman. He was an evangelist, loved to share his faith. And he's out sharing his faith. And I remember the story because he started the ministry called Navigators after this account. Navigators is a discipleship ministry that feeds people, stuffs the Word of God into their lives and grows them. But he wasn't before this. He was driving by a golf course on his way home. It's raining. This guy hitchhiking picks him up, and the guy gets in and says, what in the world does someone bleep, bleep, bleep got to have to do to get a ride in this weather? And he says, young man, read this. Throws him a Bible. <laughs> Shares his faith. He's got a captive audience. You know, it's raining. I'm taking you home. Guy gives his life to the Lord. Fast forward a year, he's driving past the golf course, it's raining, there's a guy hitchhiking, he gets in the car, says, what in the world has a guy got to bleep, 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 got to do to get a ride in the weather like this? He says, young man, you need to re wait a minute, I know you. You gave your life to Jesus a year ago, and you're in the exact spot I left you. No one had ever come into his life to feed him. 
And he realized that the fact is, I can be a, a fisherman, but I also need to be a shepherd. Parents, you need to be fisher people with your kids, with the people that you're influencing, but a shepherd as well. And he started the ministry of the navigators out of that. The interesting thing is, if you gave your life to Jesus, you said, I'm done with it. I'm going to do it your way, Jesus. Do you know that you have 20 minutes more experience as a Christian than someone who has never given their life to the Lord? One day, 10 days, it starts. You can start looking for someone to bring into. And I say, look, at, there's all kinds of ways to do it. Hey, let's go, to a, let's go through a book together. Let's go through a book of the Bible. Let's go see if Pastor R or Mike or someone has a book that they could recommend and that we could go together and that way you could disciple each other type of thing. I have a, a friend, Pastor Don, and, and he, he came to Christ during the Jesus People movement and he's all super pumped up. Ah, oh, this is truth and I want to share it. And he starts a Bible study for young people and he goes through the book of Acts. And he says, I was only one chapter ahead of everyone else in his faith. He goes, I prayed they wouldn't ask me any other questions at the end of the day because I was only in chapter 2 and they were in chapter 1. Chapter 15 when we were in chapter 14. You can do that. God's called us to be disciplers, to be shepherds. Fourth point, second last. Peter in verse 18 and 19. I tell you the truth. When you're younger, you dressed and went where you wanted but when you're older, someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. My fourth point, and really, if you're stuck with, stuck with me this far, be prepared to follow. If this is true, what we're talking about and experiencing, be prepared to follow wherever it leads, even to death. Maybe that's metaphorical, death to myself dying to the old person, the old Peter, putting on my new identity. Maybe that's his, but maybe some of us, God's calling to something else, physical death like Peter. I don't know, but be prepared to do it. Why? How? First sub-point, your ability to lead is in direct proportion to your ability to follow in God's economy. Let me tell you that again. Your ability to lead is always in direct proportion proportion to your ability to follow in God's economy, not in the world's economy. And the key word is always humility. The opposite leads to doing things in your own capabilities, tossing your net out all night with no spiritual difference. And Peter had to have that stripped away, and that's the purpose of John chapter 21 for Peter and for us. Jesus calls him Simon instead of the rock. Stop following the old identity, Simon. Instead, follow Jesus. And John 21 was a great picture for them. And through that, God was restoring Peter to his position as leader. Rewind a couple days in this story, or a couple months. Luke 22, Satan, Jesus tells Peter, takes him to the side. He says, Satan desires to sift you. In the Greek, the word is plural. All of you, the disciples. I have prayed that your faith might not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers, speaking specifically to Peter. See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, God comforts us in our affliction so that we might then in turn comfort those who need to be comforted. Sometimes God takes us through these things, this ringing because we deserve it. Sometimes he takes it through so that we might be usable. And so you see people who are involved in addiction ministry, who have worked through it, have dealt with it, given it to God, said no to the old identity, yes to the new identity, and now they're helping others. People in the abortion ministry are almost all exclusively people who had had abortions and they worked through it. And God's forgiven them and moved them through this whole process so the enemy doesn't have a foothold in that area. And they use it. Looking through ministry after ministry and that's how it happens. And Peter was allowed to go through this because of his pride. And now he's called, look, they're going to go through it. And Satan's asking you to, to be sifted now. You've been through it. Now strengthen your brothers. How and why do I lead or follow wherever it leads because it glorifies God. I think essentially we all have to ask ourselves this question, do I love God's glory more than my own? Here's a tough one. In my marriage, I know I mention that every week, but there's no relationship so difficult at times as marriage because you have two people together. I choose to glorify you, God, in my workplace. I choose to glorify you in the things that I do and the activities. I choose to glorify you despite the fact that it's tough. The third sub-point behind that, behind being able to be prepared to follow wherever it leads, is your convictions. 
talking to a friend of mine this week, and he said this quote. He says, ultimately, if you have nothing dying for, you essentially won't have anything worth living for. I'll say that again. If you have nothing worth dying for, you essentially won't have anything worth living for. What does that mean? It means you were created for significance, and you're going to fill your life. I'm going to fill my life with all kinds of subpar things. I'm going to fill my life with stuff that is inconsequential, with foolish and lesser things, because I was built to seek significance. And if I find my significance in anything other than Jesus, it's going to be stuffed with all kinds of things because I was built for dying for something worth living for. Last point. Be amazed. What in the world does that mean? Verse 25. Jesus did many other things. If any of all these were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Ephesians 2.7, it says, essentially, it's going to take all of eternity to explore, to plumb the depths of God's riches. Isn't that amazed? amazing? It's incredible. 1 Peter 5, he says, this is his heart after years of experience. You don't need to turn there because we're out of time and I'm going to finish here. To the elders among you, I appeal you as a fellow elder, not the Pope, a witness of Christ's suffering and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Look, I'm sharing this with you because I'm a witness and I'm sharing in the glory of God to be revealed. I'm amazed and I'm going to be amazed for all eternity of this glory that's going to be revealed. That's how I can go through all these different things and how I can learn to follow him. And he says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care. Hey, whoever God's given you to care for, do it because, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be, not greedy, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples. There's humility in all this. And then he has the bookend of glory again. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. He's clearly thinking of this John 21 experience where God's called him to be a shepherd. He's like, look, I'm coming here. I'm not the chief shepherd. Those are his lambs. I have to take care of these people. I'm going to go through rough times but I can do it if I stay in a state of being amazed at the things that God's going to reveal to me, the glory that is to come. If you have any questions or you want to learn more about our church, you can check us out simply by going online to feathersoundchurch.com.